Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Like most of you, I use a small and relatively affordable telescope, and I like to find clever ways to make the best of my equipment. So today, I decided to talk about a slightly advanced topic that does not seem to get much attention, but it has the potential of providing a slight boost to the quality of your astro images by increasing the number of subs that are near perfect focus. It is known as temperature compensation. In this video, I am going to talk a little bit about the theory behind it and how to implement it in your imaging sequence using Nina. So let's get started. The air temperature is going to change throughout the course of an imaging session. Like most telescopes, mine is made of aluminum, and so it's going to expand and contract. Telescope tubes made of carbon fiber uh, are definitely better in that regard because of the thermal properties of carbon fiber. But there is something else uh, going on here, especially with refractors, and it is very visible in my own telescope. The focal length of the objective lens is going to change ever so slightly in response to temperature changes. And this causes the focus plane to move throughout the night. In the case of my telescope, as the air cools down, the focus plane moves inward. And this causes my images to lose their sharpness very quickly. The solution to this problem is to refocus throughout the night by doing multiple autofocus runs. And that is why, by the way, uh, electronic focusers are so critically important in astrophotography. On my own telescope, I use an affordable ZW EAF electronic focuser. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with that unit. Most acquisition software offer multiple conditions to trigger an autofocus. I use Nina, which is an open source image acquisition software for Windows, and I can instruct it to autofocus after a certain number of exposures or after a set amount of time. But by far the most popular strategy is to use what we call star HFR. Let me talk about that in more detail first. Nina, like most modern acquisition software, is able to measure the sharpness of an image by looking for stars in the image and by measuring their HFR, or half flux radius, which is defined as the radius of a circle around the bright center in which half of the star flux is contained. HFR is measured in pixels, and as you can imagine, the lower the value, the sharper the image. During a sequence, Nina can plot the evolution of the star HFR in a graph, and it looks something like that. So when you create your sequence, you can instruct Nina to trigger an autofocus run if the HFR increases by a certain percentage, which you can define compared to the HFR obtained right after the last autofocus run. To mitigate the impact of transient factors like wind gusts, for example, Nina will actually compute a trend from the last few images using a sample, which size you can also define. All of these strategies generally work very well, but lately I've been wondering whether there could be a better way. Let me explain. To illustrate my point, I made a model of what happens during a standard imaging session. And to visualize what happens, I created three graphs. In the top left corner, I drew a graph of the air temperature in Celsius degrees. In the top right corner, I drew the star HFR graph. And at the bottom, I visually represented the evolution of the position of the focal plane, the autofocus curve, and the HFR as the focal plane moves inward, as is the case with my telescope. In this simulation, we're taking one exposure every five minutes, and I will autofocus every 12 images, which is every hour. Let's start the simulation. As the temperature cools down, the focus plane moves inward, as you can see with the blue dots moving to the left in the bottom panel. As a result, the star HFR increases, slowly at first, but then it starts to increase faster. At some point, the software triggers an autofocus and the star HFR drops again. The temperature continues to cool down, but as the night progresses, the rate of cooling decreases 
and so the peak right before the next autofocus is not quite as high as the previous one. And then the cycle starts again. What you just saw was a simulation, which I created for the purpose of this video. Here is a sample sequence I ran a few days ago while imaging NGC 1491. As you can see, the HFR graph is fairly similar to the one we saw in the simulation. So this approach generally works very well, and I have been getting good results using it. But then it got me thinking, could we somehow, quote unquote, flatten the curve between autofocus runs, which would technically improve focus on all of the subs and hopefully get us better results in the end. To do this, you can certainly reduce the value of the HFR trigger from the default value of 5% to 2%, for example. But this can also work against you by triggering too many autofocus runs, if it's a little windy or if the seeing is not so great. So then you can increase the sample size, but that can also work against you because then you won't react quickly enough to changes in conditions. Another approach is to attempt to take into account the impact of temperature changes. The idea is to measure how much the air has cooled since the last exposure and to move the focuser by just the right amount, possibly after every exposure, depending on how long they are. This is called temperature compensation. The good news is that Nina already has all of the tools to do this. From a hardware point of view, all you'll need is, of course, an electronic focuser with an accurate temperature sensor. The popular ZWO EAF has a built-in temperature sensor, but it is notoriously inaccurate. However, ZWO makes an external temperature probe for the EAF, which improves the accuracy of the temperature reading, and it only costs about $11. So I think it's a must. Also, if you use the ZWO EAF, make sure that you update its firmware to at least version 3.3.5 because ZWO implemented fixes that are supposed to improve the accuracy of the temperature measurement, at least according to the changelog. Even with that, I think that the temperature reading is too jumpy to be usable for our purpose with the EAF. I don't know if my unit is defective or if this is a well-known problem with the ZWO EAF. I'm not sure. But I ended up implementing a virtual focuser ASCOM driver that averages the temperature over a two minute rolling window and that makes the temperature reading much more stable and also much more accurate, which is critical for our application. You can read the instructions and download the ASCOM driver from its GitHub repository. I also linked to the repository in the description below. Now there are two steps involved. The first step, which you only really need to do once, is to create a linear model describing how your telescope focus responds to temperature changes. This will give us two numbers, the slope and the intercept. The second step is to use this linear model, so basically the two numbers I just mentioned, in a carefully crafted imaging sequence. All right, let's start by looking at how we can create our model. Creating the linear model is something that you could technically do manually, but again, the Nina developers made that even easier. You can use the autofocus report analysis plugin, which was developed by Stefan Berg, who is the creator and primary maintainer of Nina. The plugin is officially available and can be installed from the plugin tab. Just make sure that you have the latest version installed it should be at least version 1001 because previous versions did not work at all if you also use the Hocus Focus plugin. I reported the issue on the Nina Discord server and Stefan fixed it the next day, which is pretty amazing. Once installed, you simply have to click on the three dots in the plugin page and point to the folder that contains your autofocus report files, which are in JSON format, that were previously created by Nina. By default, the plugin will load all reports, but you can apply additional filters, like for example, a specific date range or even a temperature range. And this is actually extremely helpful for us because the model generated is a linear model and it's highly unlikely that your telescope behaves in a perfectly linear fashion over the wide range of temperatures that you may encounter throughout the year. 
So why use a linear model then? Why not be fancy and use, I don't know, something like a quadratic or a cubic model or even something more esoteric? Well, the main problem is that every telescope is going to be different. And the plugin developer wanted to create something that was simple, useful, and that everyone could use. And a linear model is perfect for that. The only downside is that you may want to generate multiple models, for example, one for the warm summer nights and one for the cold winter nights. And you'll see that the slope and intercept are likely to be slightly different between the two models. Then it's up to you to decide which model best fits your current weather conditions. Note that since we are going to use temperature compensation in relative mode, more on this later, we don't care about the intercept, we only really care about the slope. So to accurately measure the slope, I ended up creating a very simple sequence that runs an autofocus every 20 minutes for about six hours. So that gives me roughly 18 data points, which should provide enough accuracy for our needs. I saved that sequence so that I can run it later in summer when the temperature is warmer. In the autofocus report analysis plugin, I select only the data from that imaging sequence in order to get a reliable result. Oh, one last thing. While using the autofocus report analysis plugin, before blindly accepting a model, make sure that you review the value of the coefficient of determination, also known as R square. This value tells you how well the model fits the data, which also tells you how accurately the model should be able to predict future values. And it should be as close to 1.0 as possible. In my case, the autofocus report analysis plugin tells me that the slope is roughly 17 steps per Celsius degree and an R square value of 0.98, which is a really good fit. Okay, so now that we have a model, what do we do with it? That's the next step. One of the big misconceptions about temperature compensation is that if you use it, you no longer have to do any autofocus runs. Well, let me tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. The reason is that, first of all, a linear model is just an approximation, which is only valid for a narrow temperature range. Also, there are simply too many variables for such a simple model to be reliable. So my strategy is the following. You autofocus at the beginning of your sequence, and then once per hour, or even once every couple of hours, that should be plenty. In between autofocus runs, and every few minutes, or after every exposure, depending on how long your exposures are, you can move the focuser using the Move Focuser by Temperature instruction, which is available in Nina's Advanced Sequencer. Just make sure to configure that instruction with the appropriate model, which we got earlier, and most importantly, use it in relative mode. Now that we have enabled temperature compensation, let's compare the HFR graph we get with the baseline that I showed you earlier. And I think the result is striking. We've literally flattened the graph and all of our subs are now perfectly in focus without increasing the number of autofocus runs. Isn't that amazing? Now let me temper your enthusiasm. First of all, my personal experience with temperature compensation is that it is only really useful if the seeing is very good. Otherwise, if the seeing is not so great, the variations in HFR from image to image will actually be greater than the impact of the temperature change on the position of the focus plane. In this situation, you can most certainly continue to use temperature compensation, just like I showed you, and it won't hurt, but you probably also won't notice its effect on the HFR graph. The second important detail is that temperature compensation is only really useful when there is a large temperature change throughout the night. Out here in Northern California, it happens in spring, summer or fall, but in winter the temperature change is not that drastic. And again, while temperature compensation will not hurt, you may not see any obvious benefit from it. Hopefully that makes sense.
I hope that you'll consider giving temperature compensation a try. If you do, please leave a comment below to let us know whether it worked well for you. And if you found this video helpful, please click like and consider subscribing to the channel. Until next time, thank you for watching.